So, by now, by now, after last Sunday and Tuesday, um, we have a pretty good idea who John the Apostle is. We studied about his background, who he was, his family, not for the sake of, you know, as Maltese like to do, talk about people, but to see his character and to also understand the way and why he was writing this letter of First John. Not just the first letter of St. John, but even the gospel and the other two letters. We have seen that he had a very short temper, and that makes me feel good because, you know, <laughs> um, um, I'm not that sanctified as I wish um, I would be. But when things didn't go his way, he went to Jesus and asked him to send fire from heaven to burn the Samaritans because they didn't help them. And in another way, he used the influence of his family relationship with Jesus so that they will have a very close place in heaven uh, near to him. So he was acting like any normal human being, like any other uh, person, like any other Christian, that um, uh, with his own character. However, regardless, his family connections, his trade as a fisherman, and his attitude, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he gave us beautiful writings that are not matched in any other category. It's the easiest writings that we can read in the New Testament. The Greek is easy compared with Luke and Hebrews, for example. He wanted to make sure that his message is understood. And his message is felt, his heartfelt message is felt in the way he wrote, especially this first John. As we follow the reading, of the first chapter, we'll see how much he wanted to say in a short space. It's compact. There's so much we can expand there as we go along in the following weeks. However, there is one underlying thread. We heard about the threads, the golden threads that made up the curtain and the uh, high priest clothes and so forth. That thread which is very important for us even today, that we as a church have fellowship with one another like Jesus have fellowship with his Father. What a level of friendship. What a level of relationship. And he emphasizes through the letter, we'll find the word koinonia, several times repeatedly because that's his goal. He wants us to have fellowship. He wants us to have fellowship together as the body of Christ. And he wants us to have fellowship the same way Jesus has fellowship with his Father. We have seen this, uh, this fellowship expressed and we've seen a highlight of it in the Gospel of John, when Jesus was praying in the chapter 17, we can see the heartfelt prayer of Jesus, the fellowship, the, the oneness that existed between the Father and the Son. And that is what Paul, sorry, that's what John wants us to have because when he wrote this letter, there were people, there were individuals 
that tried to divide the church from this wonderful fellowship. Sometimes we say, and we hear people say, and I said it several times in the past without knowing what I was saying, that, oh, I wish we had our church like the New Testament church. And then we have to revisit that wish or that desire because the New Testament churches were full of problems. And I think I, knowing our problems is enough but reading the problem that some of those churches had is incredible. For example, in Philippi, besides having outside persecution, there were people at each other's neck. They were people that had selfish ambition. They were conceited. They were seeking self-glory. They were proud. That's what Paul was writing about. That was the problem with the people there in the Corinthian church. The Corinthian church, you had problems. Who's the best leader? Who's the leader I'm going to follow? They had problems with the use of the gifts of the Spirit. And Paul had to write 1 Corinthians to make things right. We don't follow worldly leaders. We follow Jesus. Leaders are just servants like each one of us. The church in Ephesus, there were great disunity between them. They lacked patience with one another. And therefore, Paul writes to them about the concepts of the bond of peace. About looking at each other because we are one in Christ. Because there is one Lord. There is one God. There is one Father. There is one baptism. So he's, they are writing these letters to solve the problems that existed in that particular church. And obviously, we find most of those problems in our churches today. However, our, our, our study is from the first letter of John. Next week, God willing, we'll start going through the text. But we need to, again, spend some more time to try and see what this church was going through. What was going on through that church. And like every other church, there were um, struggling between the members, between the leadership, and so forth. We, as we read through the letter, we realize that there will be differences in mission or vision. Definitely, there were problems about beliefs. We spoke last uh, Tuesday about the different philosophies that existed in the first century and later they formed in what we, sh with what we call Gnosticism, which is a generic word for other types of philosophies. We might follow some of these next Tuesday as well. And there were problems as well with, with leadership. Who, was the, who are the leadership in the church? Those who are bringing this false doctrine, trying to divide the church? Or John and his apostles, his, French, his, his uh, apostolic authority? There were definitely relational problems, and there was moral problems, and there was ethical problems. All these are in these five chapters. We can find them, and we shall study them. And we shall say, okay, what a bad church that was. Really, it's not the purpose to condemn that church. The purpose we have this writing so that we can see it as a, our model. How, what do we need to do, or what do we need to study? So we will not fall into the same mistakes. Every letter we read in the Bible, every gospel, every prophetic book, every historical book, it is there so that we will make it our model. We need to copy, we need to apply what we learn into our lives, and we need to learn from the principles of the powers of demons that to allow them influence us in these days. Obviously, we find that the church in those days, in the first hundred years of Christianity, they had the problems not just internally, but also externally. And I'm not just referring to the Jewish religion, which was split as well. But we're talking about the different 
Christian denominations in the first century. Really? Denominations are, you know, a modern thing. No. The denominations always existed because a denomination is a group of people having the same faith, having the same vision, having the same vision. So in the Christian era of the first century, we find the Messianic Jews. That's the first denomination. They were Jews that believed in Jesus and became Messianic Jews. Paul was a Messianic Jew. And the rest of the apostles were Messianic Jews. And yet, because of the calling of Christ, as it was prophesied in Isaiah, we find Paul, the Jewish Paul, going to reach the Gentiles. So we have the Gentile church now. That's another group of people. Another group of beliefs. And I'm not talking about orthodox beliefs. They were the same. But they had the different way of worship. But then we have these kind of people that were troubling the church, which we call them today Gnosticism, Gnostics, which had several branches, and later through the years they developed in some doctrines that we have today. And they were causing trouble. They were causing trouble because they did not believe in the, the orthodoxy of the doctrine of the church. And that's why very early in the church, the church started writing the creeds and so forth. What we need to know and what we really need to understand in our time is that the problem of fellowship between one another, the fellowship of the church, must become an important endeavor in our life. We are living in an independent world. People are independent. Even in marriage, where it's really supposed to have that oneness, we have now, I want to be independent. The wife independent from the husband. The husband independent from whatever the wife is doing. No, there is oneness. And I think I explained this last Tuesday. When God declared the husband and wife one, it's the same word when he said, the Lord your God is one, which is a had, which means united, not single number one. It means a united couple. And the church is to be one in Christ. And that's why I referred to the officious and to the Philippian church, God wants his church to be one, to be in fellowship with one another. As Jesus is in fellowship with the Father. And why do we need to do this? We need to do this because if we look into other parts of the Bible, like the book of Hebrews, we realize that we need more and more each other. The book of Hebrews teaches us that when we see the day coming, we are to meet more often together. We are to have more fellowship with each other. Why? So that we can have these nice meals we have every month? No, that's part of it. But because we need to strengthen one another. We need to encourage one another. We need to build each other. Like iron sharpens iron. We must be there for one another. In the first century church, remember that John is writing these letters between AD 90 and A.D. 98. His gospel, these three letters, including the book of Revelations. And in those days, as I already referred, that were people, false prophets, false teachers, bringing a different doctrine than the doctrine of the apostles. That's why we have what is called the Apostle Creed. 
And one of the problems that they were, one of the teachings that they were trying to influence people with was that Jesus was not the Christ. Today we call it docetism. Jesus appeared to be the Christ. So the person crucified on the cross was not the real Jesus, the Messiah. It was just the man, Jesus. Doctrines like this, emphasizing that Jesus is not God in the flesh. And this is why John 1.1, 1, 1, and we discussed this last week, and the beginning of this book, we will discuss this next week, is very important to understand why John is writing these words. Because, you know, even today, Christians say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. And I think nobody in this room would say, no, he's not. But the way we know that a person truly believes that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is God, Jesus is Savior, is by how that person responds to Jesus. We find that in this short letter, several times, John is saying, you, we, or the church, needs to obey the commandments. Today you have these bright spiritual people. Oh, the commandments are not for today. There is no law for us today, really. Read your New Testament again. We don't believe in those sacrifices to be burned because we know that part of the law was fulfilled in Christ, but the moral law will remain forever and the ethical laws that we have here will remain forever because if Jesus said do not lie, it will remain do not lie forever. And therefore, when we have people, Christians, claiming they are Christians and live by the world, because some people were telling them, it doesn't matter what you do in the flesh, as long as you are born again, you are saved and you remain saved. We hear this teaching as well today. So you can do what you like, because once you're saved, you're saved. So Gnosticism has its polar extreme somewhere you have to be very very strict and the other side of Gnosis was you live free as you like and John was saying hey if you say you believe in God and still live in sin you're a liar Paul says if you want to be a friend to the world you do not know God and therefore this this book, like the other books we studied previously, are there for us to be an X-ray, a spiritual X-ray, or an MRI, or whatever these modern machines that see what's in our bodies. We need to allow this Word of God to tear in the inside of us like that sharp knife of a surgeon. The Bible says that the word of God is like a two-edged sword. It's a small sword compared with a larger sword. And that sword separates what goes in our soul, in our mind. It, it shows us what is of God and it shows us what is of the flesh. But we need to allow that sword to enter us and to convict us of our sin. Because sin separates us from fellowship with Jesus and with the Father. And if I don't have a genuine fellowship with Jesus and the Father, I cannot have a genuine fellowship with a fellow born-again, spirit-filled Christian. 
Some say, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. And I, we had the, two or three weeks ago, we spoke about this. How can you say you love Jesus, but hate the church? The church is the body of Jesus. It's like a, one of these slangs that people try to use today. You know, these uh, nice uh, words that sound spiritual, but many of them are nonsense. How can you love your... How can you say you love God if you hate your brother? This is one of the principles of John. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I hope that each one of you has read John several times since we've been announcing our teaching of John. And if you did, you would have come across everything I've said today, which will be expounded in our sermons as we go through the book. So therefore, brothers and sisters, as I come to a close, because our time is already uh, passed, and we have a song, right? John's opponents denied the sun. Today we live in a world denying the sun. As so when, not sun. People make fun of us when we say, but Jesus said, the word of God says, the Bible, in the Bible it is written. They make fun of us. And unfortunately, there are now also evangelical churches that do not hold the Bible as the authoritative word of God. Unfortunately, we have traditional denominations denying the sanctity of the body, the sanctity of marriage. And all these signs, besides the comets, you know, I mentioned comets some time ago, and if you follow that, you'll find that every week they are finding comets that they did not know about, and they are coming closer to Earth. Have you read that NASA is trying to nuke one of them? Did you read, read that? Uh, did you read that? It's coming. They think they're going to stop what Revelation says. There's no way they're going to stop what God said he will do when it's time to judge the world. And therefore, brothers and sisters, as children of God, born again, filled with his spirit, if there is one thing that we need to learn, if there is fellowship between us, as Jesus has fellowship with the Father, we will be able to help one another live the life of sanctity, live the life of righteousness by being able to receive correction, and then you will have the right to give correction. We all need it. We all need it, especially as we see the day coming. So as I close, um, I want uh, to encourage you to keep on reading the book of uh, First John. Study it. Use some study Bible to help you. And through the sermons, we'll give you more exposition. Um, uh, we'll continue this subject on Tuesday. Praise God.